Welcome everybody. My name is Connie Fonzo. I'm going to be talking to you later today. But in the meantime, I'm going to introduce a couple of our next speakers. Uh, Wendy Trotter from the Department of Education. Wendy has over 20 years of working experience with individuals with autism in a variety of settings, including specialty schools, public schools, and pediatric outpatient therapy. She joined the Department of Education as an educational consultant in 2014, and she has training in a number of therapeutic techniques and intervention approaches. She advocates for the integration of various treatment models to meet the needs of children with autism spectrum disorders at any given developmental level. And also Betsy Lynn. Ms. Lynn has worked in the field of early childhood special education for over 17 years as an early childhood special education teacher in both inclusive and segregated settings. She joined the Dep Department of Education in 2012 as an early childhood special education consultant. She works on projects involving special education law, professional development, assessment, and criteria for the Iowa Quality Preschool Program Standards. So welcome our next speakers. Good morning. So I'm Wendy. We actually already gave an introduction, so I don't have to tell you who I am. Um, but I will add that we do have an additional person who's crashing our presentation today. We did ask Cindy Weigel, who is our state coordinator for early access, which is Iowa's early intervention system. So um, we've asked Cindy to join us today so she could kind of talk about the early access component of things. Um, go to the next slide. Wrong button. This is hard to do. Too many things in my hands. Is it going? Okay. So what we will, what we plan to talk about this morning is we're going to talk a little bit about what early access is, what those services look like for our youngest learners, the zero to three year olds. We're going to talk a little bit about what that transition process is from early access to special education services, should they qualify for special education services. And then if we have time, we're going to talk a little bit more about, well, we're going to talk about the special education services, what those look like. And if we have time, we'll touch on um, a few evidence-based practices, what those might look like. Uh, we did include a lot of information in our slides, knowing full well that 45 minutes is not a lot of time to power through all of this information. So there are some slides we may skim over, but we wanted you to have that information. So that's why you have that information in your handouts. So you can go back and refer to it at a later time if we're not able to devote to it the amount of time that we think it really needs. So without further ado, I am going to have Cindy go ahead and get us started talking a little bit about those early access services, what they look like, and where you go from there. Okay. Slides this way. I guess, yeah. I've struggled with that. Good morning. Um, uh, it's really hard to like follow a lounge act like I just know. happened here. So I just have to say that and get that uncomfortableness out of my way because I'd rather be anywhere than standing up and talking in front of a big crowd, except that I am very passionate about the work um, that we do in early access. And um, I want to say that I really appreciate this idea of these five pillars. I'm like in the back one, huh, this, that is really an interesting idea. And I even appreciate the gentleman with the bow ties comment about how do we get this to work all together because it really is about tying those five pillars together. Sometimes I talk about the work that we do is we've got these unlaced boot that's really loosely tied together with laces and I'm trying to always pull those laces tighter to bring those two sides together so that we can do what's best for families and kids. So in my mind, I'm like lacing your pillars together, thinking, how do we do this? I'm thinking, oh, it's the beginning of something new to think about, and we can talk more. <laughs> so um, early access is Iowa's early intervention system for families served under IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, for infants and toddlers, or Part C. And um, really, we are focusing on services for the family that builds their capacity to help their child develop and learn. So it's not the focus 
on the child, the focus is on the family. The children are the reason we do our work, but the families are the focus for getting the work done. Um, and we have sort of three global outcomes we want to achieve for all infants and toddlers, those 6,000 kids that was presented as a number, um, so that those children can participate in home and community. That's the goal, right? One of those, this is called early childhood outcomes. A lot of you in this room that are from AEAs know the word ECHO. We, we track early childhood outcomes across the United States in three areas. First ones, we want to increase children's knowledge and skills, and this includes their communication and language skills. We want children to have positive social relationships with their peers and with the adults in their lives. And then finally, we want children to learn to use appropriate behaviors to meet their needs. So every infant and toddler and their family that is, participates in early access, a voluntary program, has these three global outcomes for their children. We are really moving to, we are striving to use evidence-based practices statewide for when we do early intervention in Iowa. And um, when I say evidence-based practice, what I mean is that there are really smart people, there are doctors and researchers in this world that have figured out what it is that helps us help those families to have their children develop and learn. And those researchers publish their results of their research in top-tier journals, meaning those that are reviewed by, reviewed by other peers so when we say evidence-based, this is what I'm talking about, because that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. In early intervention, there's sort of three major pieces of things that we are concentrating on. One, we want to, that yellow circle, to implement learning in the natural environments for kids. Family-guided routines-based intervention should sound familiar to those of you in the AEAs who've been going through training for the last three years. Um, Another piece of the red oval, or the circle, I know my shapes, early childhood, I know my shapes. <laughs> the red circle is coaching practices, and what we mean by that is how do we use adult learning strategies to help families learn whatever that discipline-specific uh, intervention is, how do, how do we get the families to be able to use that intervention with integrity, right? They're, they're doing the practice in the home throughout their routines, and this is for all children that are served in, in early access, not some children, but for all children and all families. And then that blue circle is called the primary service provider uh, sort of teaming practices, where we really know that um, building the relationship with the families of these infants and toddlers is critical to successful outcomes for those kids. and. The more providers you have in the home, the less um, satisfying and less helpful it actually becomes for families. There's research to show that. So we're saying let's pick a primary person, not the only person, but a primary person to stay with that family throughout their time in early access so that they will be able to build that strong relationship and have a real advocate in their corner for helping them get to the outcomes that they need. So when we talk about early intervention, early access in Iowa, I'm talking about these three things going on in the state. It's not statewide at this time. There are pockets in every AEA um, that are going through this shift from sort of a child therapy to this family focus. Uh, but this is, this is where the state is moving. When we talk about family-guided routines-based intervention, there's really a foundation that these four corners are involved, <coughs> excuse me, uh, are involved in FGRBI, or Family Guided Routines-Based Intervention. The focus is on everyday routines, activities, and places where that family is at. So early intervention might be happening in a park, in a grocery store, getting a child in a car, uh, in the home itself, during bath time, meal time. It can be anywhere the family typically is at and their routines. Um, the functional participation-based outcomes means that we work with the family as professionals to find out what it is they want to focus on that is makes, makes sense to the family and helps that child function 
in the setting. The embedded evidence-based instruction means it's really, it's embedded in those everyday routines. It's not homework, it's not something extra, it is embedded. And that is family-centered, really um, very much focused on what the family values, what the family needs, what the family wants, combined with the expert opinion of, uh, or the expertise of the providers here with the family. The heart of all of this, again, is coaching that caregiver, that family, to be able to embed these routine or these strategies, these interventions into those everyday routines. So that's the framework of early access. This is a very short period of time in a child's life, a critical period of time, but once they start reaching that 36 month mark, they're gonna transition into what's IDEA Part B, special education. And this is just some reminders of sort of timelines when that happens. If your child turns about two years, uh, three months, if not before, you start talking about this transition process and there are, are um, special steps and services that have to take place during transition. The biggest point I wanna make about transition is the IFSP, the, I, uh, the Individualized Family Services Plan, is not an IEP for little kids. It's not an individual education program for infants and toddlers. So there's this huge shift in sort of philosophy and um, eligibility for moving into the next step. Um, if you are, if, if a child is in early access, it doesn't mean they're gonna be in special education. It is just not, a, it's not an automatic step. It's really about people using different sources of data, sitting down as a team with the family as a team member, the people in special education, the people in early access, and working on a plan together to see how a child, this three-year-old, may or may not move into special education. So that's just a brief snippet of what early access is and what it sort of the foundation of what is early intervention in our state. And I know there's people here in this room that could stand up here and be telling you this exact same story and uh, do just as, just as good a job. We've really moved to um, sort of our little mantra, children are the reason, families are the focus. I do want to just add another little uh, piece of information because we, um, through the Department of Education, have started an initiative in the state of Iowa introducing um, an online translator. And we have been training um, AEA early access providers in using the same kind of approach. So we're really looking at, and Kelly Hugo, and that whole question in that we're kind of talking about the naturalistic development of behavioral intervention, and that's kind of what this is as well. So Autism Navigator is um, a program that, involves, or that teaches providers how to coach parents in embedding those intervention strategies in their everyday routines and activities. So it really, um, got, it's using the same methodology of coaching and using family-guided community-based intervention. Also, with that autism lens and coaching families, how to really make sure that we're maximizing those skills and those strategies with everything that they're doing. Because with children with autism, a lot of times, as many of you know, generalization can be a little bit tricky. So it's definitely with our youngest learners very helpful if they're using those skills and strategies in the situations they're going to be using them in. So I just wanted to add that really quick. So I think if you're hearing a buzz about it, I do have a few resources at the back of the couple that more about some of that in but um, just want to make sure that you're aware of that. But another piece of the early intervention system that we're really specific to autism. And I'll turn this over to Beth. Good morning. Um, so I'm just going to add um, again, my name is Betsy Lynn. I am a consultant at the Iowa Department of Education, and I really work with preschool programming, mostly with early childhood special education, so programs that are serving children ages three to five in preschool programs. And then I also do some work with our um, statewide voluntary preschool program. And when we were asked to um, speak today, it was around preparing for school-based services. And, 
And um, that's a big topic for 45 minutes, but um, we want to share some information. And, and I think the number one thing that I want to share with you is just the knowledge about what is school-based services? What does special education look like for preschoolers? Um, one of my responsibilities at the Department of Ed is I get to take calls from parents and families who are having difficulty navigating the system. And so I hear on a regular basis, what does this mean? What are the rights? What is they're trying to do this? Is that okay? So we try to get out there and, and let families know that this is what you should expect. These are the rights that you have and that your child has so that you can go into those IEP meetings with that knowledge and to be able to work as a team because sometimes um, as school professionals we forget that families come in and may not know what is an IEP, um, what is IDEA, what are those pieces. So I'm just going to share um, some information about what special education looks like once the child turns three and they qualify. So um, uh, Cindy mentioned IDEA, it's the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. This is the federal law that um, ensures all children with disabilities will receive free appropriate public education, often referred to as FAPE. And this applies to children birth to age 21. So it really is the overarching law in our country um, protecting children's rights and making sure they're getting what they need um, in the education system. At age three, however, that responsibility of special education really is shifting. It's going from the AEAs to now the public school districts. AEAs are still involved in that, but that um, responsibility of providing the free appropriate public education is now the school district's responsibility. Once a child's determined to be eligible for special education, um, the IEP team is going to convene to write the IEP. Now, if your child was in early access, receiving early intervention services through the AEA, it's very, very important that this IEP is written before the child's third birthday. It's one of the things that we actually report to the Federal um, Office of Special Education Programming. So that's a point that I always want to make sure families know, that this um, IEP needs to be in place before the child's third birthday, if they were already in early intervention services. IEP stands for Individualized Education Program, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what that's going to involve and who's going to be involved in that process. So who is part of the IEP team? <clears throat> Parents, family of the child is always involved. You are part of the IEP team. I tell families that all of the time. It's not the school district telling you. It's not the IEP, um, it's not the AEA telling you what's going to happen. You are part of that team, and you have just as much um, decision making right on that team as everybody else. You're all equal partners, so please always remember that. In addition to the family, um, there should be a general education teacher and a special education teacher on that team as well. Now sometimes that can be the same person, especially in preschool. Um, for our early childhood programming um, in Iowa, we have what's called a dual endorsement, which means a preschool teacher can be both a general education teacher and the special education teacher at the same time. It's something that is very unique to preschool. So sometimes that role will be the same person and that's okay. But you need to have someone there with the knowledge of what general education um, for that age is and then someone with the knowledge of special education. Another person that's required to be on the IEP team is a qualified representative of the school district. Somebody from the school district who can um, commit the resources and um, what the program is going to be. So it needs to be, it's often an administrator, such as the school principal, um, a special education director, or it could be somebody else that this district has deemed as, this is our representative, whatever the team agrees to, they can um, commit those resources. Um, another person on the team is an individual who can interpret the evaluation results. So once your child has been deemed as qualifying for special education services, there's going to be a report that comes to the team that describes here are all the things that um, we found as potential needs, strengths, all of that in that report needs to be interpreted by someone on the IEP team. Often that's somebody from the AEA who will um, help do that. And then the last bullet is um, other individuals with expertise regarding the child as appropriate. This could be the SLP, the OT, the PT. It could be um, someone that the family invites who you want to have as additional voice um, for the IEP team. If the school district invites any additional people, um, they need to let the family know. 
Okay, that is required by law. They can't just spring on you. Oh, we're going to invite, have these two people come. They need to let you know as a family member who is going to be at the IEP team meeting. Families can invite who they want. They do not have to tell the school district who they're bringing, but they should. It, it, it helps build that um, team collaboration. Um, at this point, I also want to mention um, another resource that could be very helpful for families through our AEAs. Um, it used to be called the PEC, Parent Educator Con Connection, thank you. The acronym has now changed to FEC, Family Educator, nope, I did it wrong, FEP, Family Educator Partnership, sorry. It's just changed recently. These are, through our AEAs, every AEA has some FEP staff that are family members with children with disabilities who are there to help families navigate this process. So at our table in the back, if you want more information about the FEPs, um, we've got information for you who to contact at your AEA. Really great resource for families as questions come up, um, things that might not be going well that you would like some help with, they're there to support you. Sometimes they are also part of the IEP team, not required, but it can happen. So just want to bring up that resource. So what will happen at the first IEP meeting? Um, these are all of the things the IEP team will discuss and, and, and collaborate on. They'll talk about the child's present level of performance. The goals are written similar to an IFSP, but um, a little bit different. It's, it's going to be child focused. What does this child need to work on? What is our goal for them in the next year? And how are you going to measure um, the progress of how that goal is going? Um, the bulk of the IEP is really going to be around those special education services and supports, um, all of those pieces that need to be in place for the child to be successful. Um, an additional piece I will say that everything that's written on the IEP is a legally binding document, so the district is required to provide that. So there'll be beginning dates in there, it'll tell you exactly when the service will start, when it will end, how frequent the service is going to be, um, who the provider is, not by name but by position. Um, and you will also be discussing educational placement, and I'm going to go a little bit more into that one. This is a big question um, that we get often for preschool. Where will my preschool child receive their services? And um, once a child starts special education services, we talk a lot about least restrictive environment, so LRE. And what that means, federal law states that, the ch that children with disabilities must receive their services with children who do not have a disability to the maximum extent appropriate, okay? So the IEP team together are going to determine what type of setting is going to be best for the child to make progress. And we have what we call a continuum of, of types of settings. So you start with the least restrictive. Um, the preschool where any child who lives in that neighborhood would go, regardless if they have a disability, if they don't, it's an open preschool to anybody. That would be the least restrictive. And then you kind of work back from there. Um, maybe the child needs um, a smaller class size. Maybe the child needs less children with higher adult ratio. Those are the types of discussions that you have in the IEP team to talk about that setting. But we always want to start with the least restrictive, the preschool where um, all children go and it's not going to be some type of special placement. You start with that and then you work backwards. The tricky part um, that we get a lot of questions from parents are is then the location of that type of setting. There's setting and then there's location. The setting is the type. Is it going to be an inclusive preschool program? Is it going to be a segregated classroom. That's determined by the IEP team. The district gets to determine the location of where that's going to be. So for example, um, in Des Moines, there are lots of different preschool options. The district gets to determine where. In the smaller districts, there's not going to be a lot of options. They may just have one preschool setting that meets that need. But that location piece really is going to be um, on the district. They do have to make it as close to the child's home as possible. Another question that we get a lot that I will take a little bit of time on and then I think i got to move a little faster. Um, can my child receive special education services in their current daycare? Um, a lot of times children are already placed and so are already going to some type of 
um, child care center, daycare, home provider, can those services be um, provided there? And the answer is maybe, it depends. We have some things around the law that says, number one, the teacher has to be licensed. So if they don't have a special education license, then that cannot be a place where they get their special education services. We also state that the, the setting, that um, that location has to meet standards. We want the children in the highest quality possible um, uh, location of early childhood services. So they have to be meeting either Head Start standards, we have our own Iowa Quality Preschool Program standards, or it could be NACI accredited. But if they're not meeting one of those three, then it's not a possibility for the district to use that as a location. But there can be some flexibility. Um, for example, we get a lot of children who may be in Head Start. So they're already in Head Start. Now they've been identified as needing special education services. Can those services be provided in the Head Start? They can be. Again, if they're meeting all of those um, different uh, standards. However, it really is up to the district. And so there has to be really strong collaboration going on between the district and the community and um, discussion around what that could look like. So it is possible, but again, it's, it's up to the district of where that location will be. Um, I'll go through a couple of these quickly. These are just some kind of the services that you will be discussing as an IEP team, specially designed instruction. That really is what makes special education special. It's what are the things that the child needs to really access um, the preschool curriculum, the environment, what is going on in that classroom day. What do we need to do special for this child? And all of those are free, free and appropriate, remember, in FAPE. So there is no cost to families for that. You'll also discuss support services, what type of speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, paraprofessional support. Is there extra adult support that the child needs? And again, it should, it should state exactly how much and when and where. Some accommodations you'll also discuss as well. Um, these are things like visual cues, schedules, seating arrangements, um, sensory items, prompting, frequent breaks. Those are all types of accommodations that will be discussed at the IEP meeting and, and put into the IEP. Assistive technology are um, pieces of equipment or product systems that the child might need. This is very common in preschool for children who are nonverbal, who need some type of communication support. So those are we often see in the preschool um, setting. I will pass it over to uh, Wendy for a few minutes of what's left here, about 15. Okay. All right, so just kind of recap what we talked about so far so far. So our youngest learners, our zero to three year olds, our toddlers, the focus a lot of times for those children is you know, it's developmental. It's how are you know, how are they accessing the environment so that they can learn. Children learn by watching what's going on around them, by engaging in their environment. And so our focus a lot of times for our youngest learners is on how we can coach families and caregivers to be able to make sure that their toddler is actively engaged and is accessing learning within their environment. And so there's a lot of focus on coaching families, there's a lot of focus on helping families move through that process. And then we make the shift to preschool. So what does it look like in a preschool setting? Well, now it's a little bit different. Families are still involved. They're still a big active part of the IEP team. However, the, the focus becomes a little bit more child focused than family focused. And so that can be a real struggle a lot of times for families as they make that shift. So as we're moving and, and most of these services are being provided directly to the child and there's less of that coaching of the caregivers, what might those services look like in the preschool setting? So we're going to talk a little bit about some of those kinds of things as well. So we, we've talked about this a couple times already, and there's going to be more talk about it later today, but there's a lot of emphasis. You're going to hear this word a lot, um, EVP or EBPs, evidence-based practices. So what we know is that these are practices that have, that research, that data has shown that they are effective. And not just that they are effective in a research setting, but that they are effective in the settings in which they're to be used. So they're effective in the classroom. They're effective in the home. So just because it's effective in a research setting doesn't mean it's effective in the classroom or in the home environment. So that's kind of what we're talking about with that. 
And I'm going to just kind of move quickly because I don't have a lot of time, but this information is in your slides so that you can look at it at a later time. There are two major reports out there specific to autism and talking about evidence-based practices. Those two reports are the National Professional Development Center, the NPDC's report, which was updated in 2014, and the National Autism Center has an updated version in 2015. Those reports look like this. So this is the NPDC report. They identified 27 evidence-based practices. What I think gets confusing a lot of times to families is they hear, um, they will often hear the umbrella term of applied behavioral analysis. And they think that that in and of itself is a practice. It's really more of a principle of learning and understanding how individuals learn. And there are specific practices that fall under that broader category of applied behavior analysis that are identified as evidence-based practices. So that's why when you see this 27 evidence-based practices, it's not, you won't see ABA listed, but you're going to see components that follow the principles of ABA and how individuals learn and how they adapt and change their behavior. So, so you understand what that means when you look at it. The National Autism Center um, has established, or 14 established interventions, 18 emerging, and 15 unestablished. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. You can look these up. We're going to include links to where you can find that information in the electronic goodie bag that comes out later. So you can look at those um, evidence-based practices yourself so you have a better understanding of what those might look like. The other thing I'm really excited that Kelly's going to be talking about are those naturalistic, I always have to look at it, naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions. What the research community has really kind of found with our youngest learners is that really um, it's not one specific thing. It's really how are we bringing those interventions into a naturalistic environment. We're using the developmental levels of those individuals, applying behavioral strategies. That It's that combination, those kinds of approaches that work best with our youngest learners. And so that's um, something else to be kind of thinking about. I mean, a lot of times when you look at those reports, the strategies may be more applicable to school-age children and older children, maybe not applicable to a two-year-old. You know, discrete trial training, sitting at a table for a two-year-old is not necessarily the best way for a two-year-old to learn. There are other more naturalistic and developmentally appropriate ways of teaching those skills. So just be aware of that. Um, in my few minutes that I have left, um, you know, I, there's a whole, like I said, there's 27 potential interventions we could talk about. Some of the more common ones you may find in a preschool setting as your child transitions to a preschool setting include a lot of visual supports, that's falling under those evidence-based practices, as well as um, peer-mediated intervention. Um, I'll just briefly describe those and then there are great online teaching tools that can help you learn more about those practices as well as a lot of those other practices that we deem as evidence-based. Uh, visual supports are is any visual display that supports the learner engaging in desired behavior or skills independent of prompts. So that's any visual support. We all use visual supports, right? She just sh showed me a five-minute warning. That was a visual support for me. So um, you know, we all use visual supports in our environment. So what are the visual supports we can put in place to help our learners be able to access the curriculum, access the learning, access the material? And so that's going to look different for every individual. It shouldn't just be a one-size-fits-all, but certainly there can be classroom supports that are beneficial to everyone. So you might have visual boundaries. You're going to see a lot of preschool classrooms that look like this, and you didn't even think about how that's a visual support, but how they have it organized into centers, how they have this is this, this area, and I've got all the items in here labeled. So those are visual boundaries. You may also have specific visual supports like task strips and schedules and choice boards and visual timers, um, first then boards, and, and be creative with those visual supports too. I think a lot of times everyone thinks it needs to be a board maker picture. Well, with, with, way back in the day, we had to use actual photographs and then you had to take lots of pictures and get them developed and you'd throw half of them away and there'd be three that were salvageable. With digital, it's wonderful, so you can use actual, and, and Google, Oh my gosh, you can get the best images off of Google Images. So, you know, be creative. And then sometimes our kids may not do well with pictures, so you can use objects. So just be creative with those visual supports. It doesn't have to just be a board maker picture. Um, peer mediated intervention. Um, what this is, is it's systematically teaching peers without disabilities ways of engaging learners with autism or autism spectrum disorder in positive and meaningful social interactions within the natural environment. So a lot of preschool settings 
Um, you can, and, it's, and there's some great um, videos up with the Affirm, which I'll show you here in a minute, showing what that looks like in those preschool settings, how you can take a typically developing peer and give them some coaching and some strategies on how to engage with our learner with autism spectrum disorder so that we're getting more of that um, natural social engagement and helping them to increase social, social skills. And that can go all the way through to high school, you know, so it's not just a preschool setting that you get that, but this was focused on those early learners, so that's why we're focusing on preschool. Um, so I, I won't spend much more time on that because I think I'm about out of time, but there are some great resources that can help you understand a lot more of these evidence-based practices, what these settings, what these um, specially designed instruction strategies might look like in the preschool setting. The autism internet modules have a lot of great information. The autism focused intervention resources and modules, the Affirm that I talked about before, they're doing the same thing. They're going through and making these online modules to train others to understand what those might look like. Autism Navigator, I alluded to earlier, it's not just an online professional development for early intervention providers. They have a lot, a lot of community and family um, resources as well. So definitely get on there and check that out, as well as for um, primary care. They have a primary care course, too. So a lot of great information. And then the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorders. Oh, I think I forgot to put the NAF one on there. But um, that's where you can have access to that report. So we'll have all of that information available for you in the um, electronic goodie bag that comes out later as well. But just to kind of, if you want to have quick access to those before that comes out, you can take this information in your handouts and use it right away. Other resources that might be beneficial to you would be the First Words Project. They've got a lot of really beautifully illustrated visual supports for us as learners to understand um, what some of those early gestures look like, first words, and, and, and uh, early learning skills. The Iowa Family Support Network the Regional Autism Assistance Program, and then the Autism Society Iowa. So this is some more regional and national um, resources that might be beneficial as well. How did I do? I managed to get that in 10, 15 minutes. So um, we want to say thank you so much, everybody, for coming here today. And hopefully you came away with some new knowledge, or at least better clarified knowledge. And um, I don't know if we have time for any specific questions. I don't we have a couple minutes, so if there's a specific question, we'd be happy to try to address one now.
consider a little bit of happening how serious it is and um, you know, kind of work with, with the partners at the school. Yeah, I was just going to answer that there is the excuse or the absence that they can sign the form. And parents would be probably able to ask for that, but that's something that they would ask for. And like you said, it all takes a set of different groups. If you want that teacher's input, they might have given it written also. So there are some procedures around if certain IEP team members can't be there or want to provide their input through writing, that they can be excused from their team, but there's some nuances with that as well. There are certain ones that that's not a possibility for. For example, the district representative cannot be excused from the IEP team meeting. They need to be there. Um, so that's sort of like you get in. There, there's so many nuances to um, different situations. So um, on the resource, I can see all of those are very people to go to to find out. And then use that procedural safeguard and stuff. And that's all. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our patients have uh, education issues. So the district also works with that. We have our mental health and daily support clinic. So we may call the family support from the house to the preschool, or even if it's just the half day preschool, family can't take off work to kind of go back and forth and then take it back to their independent care system. Do they offer them like that? Um, Thank you. 